Hello and welcome to The Drum. I'm John Barron. Coming up... Another census data dump. We're short on religion, big on diversity and long on housing debt. Also today, calls for tougher regulation of retirement villages after a troubling investigation. on the panel tonight, former WA Labor Premier Jeff Gallup. G'day, Jeff. Hello. Also joining us for the first time on the panel, journalist and author Amal Awad. Amal, great to see you too. Thank you for having me. And tonight we're joined as well by researcher Elaine, Elian Miles, I should say. It's Elian, not Elaine. That's right. Thank Got you, it. John. All right, I'll try and remember <laughs> that. Also with us, radio host and former Liberal MP Stephen O'Doherty. G'day, Stephen. Hey, John. Hi. And you can join in as well on Twitter and on Facebook where we're live streaming right now. So, the results of last year's troubled Australian census were released earlier today and the experts have pretty much given it the thumbs up despite that website crash and all those privacy concerns we heard last year. They say this is solid data and potentially invaluable when it comes to planning and policy making. Uh, we're pleased that we have a, a very high quality census in 2016 comparable with past censuses. Certainly there were some aspects of the process that we would prefer uh, would have been better. <laughs> Just over 52% of Australians say they're Christians, compared to 74% in 1991. A third of us say we are not religious, and that's up from just 13% 25 years ago. I think it just indicates that if people find themselves thinking, maybe I'm more humanist, maybe I'm more secularist, maybe I'm just spiritual but not organised religion, then no religion is for me, and the results show out. And for the first time, that is the most common answer, surpassing the number of Catholics. And while the numbers are still small in comparison, there has been a big increase in people who are Hindu, Buddhist or Muslim, mainly due to migration. The census shows more than a quarter of Australians were born overseas. England and New Zealand are still the most common countries of origin, but with increasing numbers arriving from China, India and the Philippines for the first time, there are now more migrants from Asia than Europe. And there were 1.3 million new migrants since the last census in 2011. Almost 3% of us identify as Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islanders. That's nearly double the 1996 census figures. Two thirds of Australians live in capital cities and in the last 25 years, eight out of 10 new migrants have chosen to live in capitals as well. And two million of us live alone, the majority older women, and we are an ageing population overall with one in six over 65. 35% of adults have never married and the number of single parent families has increased by almost 16% in just five years. And the number of same sex couples who are de facto or in a married partnership and typically live in the same house has increased by 39% since 2011 to 46,800. OK, there's an awful lot in that. So let's break down some of it for you. First, let's look at the religion section. Now, El, how big of a deal is it? It's gotten quite a lot of discussion today that no religion has now surpassed Catholicism as the dominant answer to that religion question. Some have suggested it could just be simply because they put no religion from last on the list to first on the list, so people are kind of donkey voting. What do you think? Well, there's a lot of factors, isn't there? And one of the, the big things to remember in all of this conversation is that still 60% of Australians somehow adhere to a religion. Hmm. So it's still the majority who say that they have a religious affiliation. And when you combine all of the Christian denominations, that figure jumps to 52%. So it's certainly still well above the 30% who say that they have no religion. How much of a, of a change in, in demographics is when we see that you know, in 25 years down from 74% Christian to 52%? Christian. Is that because we're getting a lot, a lot of non-Christian migrants or is it because people are literally losing their Christian religion as REM said? I mean what do you think is actually happening? Yeah I think it's a bit of both as well as how the question was worded seeing that increased jump from 22% to 30%. A, a lot of it is reflected in our younger generation so when we look at the 18 to 34 year olds only 40% of those adhere to Christianity. Now interestingly a greater proportion of those actually adhere to other Christians so uh, other religions are about 12% compared to the overall of 8%. 
percent. So in fact, there's this changing of the guard when it comes to the young generations. When you look at those that are retirees, those aged over 65, still more than 70 percent of those adhere to Christianity. So you're seeing that shift, that increased globalization, that secularization that's happening where Australia is really following the lead of what's happened in many parts of Europe. Stephen, how much of this do you put down to we, we are less Christian as a, as a nation? How much of it is that there is less social pressure to say I'm a Christian than there might have been in previous generations? Is that a factor? No, not at all. I mean, the, what's at play here is that the atheists actually did their dough. A very extensive campaign, billboards and, you know, social media, the whole works, they failed to kill God in this census. That's the, that's the headline So you're saying that there me. was a campaign from atheists to... Absolutely. To, well, yes, to wherever you went around Australia. Right. You know, put no, put no religion. So right. they have failed. Notwithstanding what they've said uh, today, they have failed to kill off religion. But how did that the affect the data? If somebody is not religious... The, the, I mean, if somebody was religious, they wouldn't mm. write no religion, surely, would they? Well, because they specifically said, if you normally put that you sometimes go to you know, church, don't bother, just put no religion instead. Or if you normally don't fill it out, put no religion instead. There was a specific uh, campaign to get people to opt in to that option. So they've managed to increase the number, and I think it's fair enough. I mean, that seems about right in terms of the way I read society. But nevertheless, bear in mind, their campaign was specifically aimed at saying, therefore, religion or, or religion itself, freedom for religion and so on, those issues should have nothing to do with public policy because most people don't adhere to religion. That's simply not true. So, Six so let me just pause So you, your, your argument is that uh, you're not disputing that only about half of us are Christian these days, but the sense that there's been a dramatic decline, you don't feel that that is an accurate reflection? No, it's not. It's because of the way the survey was collected. Okay. Firstly, they moved the question from the bottom to the top. Secondly, there was a deliberate campaign saying, please fill out no religion on the census. Even if you used to put Jedi, please put no religion instead. Okay. Which is literally <laughs> what they said. So, Amal, in this, there, there are, um, we're seeing increases amongst Muslim Australians, amongst Hindus as well, uh, and a range of other religions. So we are becoming more diverse in, in a religious sense. Do you, I mean, do you, do you think that this is, uh, this is, is you know, self-evident in, in our society? Do you think we are becoming more accepting of these other religions or is it something that we just sort of, as a still a dominant Christian culture, we just kind of, we tolerate other people's religions but we don't necessarily understand them or respect them? Oh, sure, all of the above. I mean, <laughs> I think that the, the thing about data like this is it's, it's just reflecting changing times, that the fact that we are a multicultural country, whatever you want to call it, multi-ethnic, multicultural. Um, I was actually surprised at the figures. I thought there would be more Muslims. 2.6%. I thought that it would be a higher figure. And then I remembered how so many Muslims I know were very paranoid about mentioning that they were Muslim. And this is not a new mm, thing. Mm -hmm. I think it's increased, though. I actually really query the, the figures because I do feel that privacy is a huge factor for people when it comes to religion. I don't think people like being bullied into to saying something either. Mm -hmm. um, I think on social media, people very freely share their lives. But the minute you ask someone to declare something in relation to your personal belief system, especially in a climate where being Muslim is a big no-no, for example, mm. I think it does get people to say... Do you say, think that well, that was down to kind of fear of Islamophobia generally in Australia or specifically around those privacy concerns around last year's census? There was the, there was the first one that was online and then there was the, the, uh, the denial of service attack and people just, a lot of people, uh, no matter what their religion, were worried about whether their information was going to be secure, whether some government in the future could use it against that's them. That's completely that what I think. Yeah. I, and I don't want to sound like a tinfoil hat conspiracy theorist here, but I really yeah. think a lot of people... <laughs> don't feel safe they don't feel safe giving that information out they feel like uh, this could be used against me one day to track me down mm. um, because people are talking about internment camps and it's not that out of the question when you think about the fact that politicians have spoken that way and it, it's happened in history so I'm not saying it's right I'm mm. very happy to put on the fact that I'm a Muslim on the form <laughs> I don't personally care but mm. I think it, it, to me, is I, I think religion is such a personal thing, and so for a lot of people, it's it's almost like, well, why do you want to know what religion I am? Well, do you think, are they more likely to be in the thirty percent saying no religion, or the ten percent who didn't answer the question, the Muslims who didn't? Well, want it's to a possibility. Isn't probably, it? Probably, it is, yeah. um, probably more like the ten percent because they'd feel bad <laughs> saying no religion. Yeah. So, Jeff, as somebody who used to be in the business of, of making mm. decisions, allocating budgets, building hospitals and schools, and doing all these mm. kinds of things, a lot of what's in the census is important. But do you? Do politicians need to know what religion I am? Well, what you're seeing in those figures you just produced for us is modern society.
Yeah. Uh, what, what that showed is that there are tremendous changes going on in our community which are reflecting in politics. We've, we've, we've noted that in the US election with the, the Bernie Sanders thing, in the British election with Corbyn. Uh, there's the, the demographic, the young people demographic is starting to work through the system, less interested in religion, uh, more pragmatic, more concerned about liberal issues, same-sex, uh, uh, marriage equality, etc. Uh, and any politician who's serious about being a politician would look very carefully at all of those figures. I take them as their indicator. I don't believe there's any way that we can interpret them any other way than what people have put on the paper, which is there's change going on, and if you're a politician and you don't make note of that, you might quickly find yourself in the dustbin of history. So, uh, unlike Amal and, 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 and Stephen, you're, not, you're, you're prepared to take this data on, on face value. Uh, of course. W what, about, what about one of the suggestions for the, the, the decline in the number of uh, self-identified Catholics in Australia, that this may be in some way related to uh, diminished prestige for the Catholic Church based on the child sexual abuse scandals? Well, you know, the context of uh, the, the whole census must include uh, the revelations about what the Christian churches and other institutions were doing in respect of abuse. Yeah. That is a factor. Uh, and, and if people say that their institutions are based on God and God happens to be revealing himself in those institutions through abuse, you might ask the question, should I believe in God? Mm. So, El, as, as the one who understands how these numbers work, what about this suggestion we've heard that there could be some under-reporting, whether it's, you know, it's none of your business, I don't want to say that I'm a Muslim if I fear there could be a backlash, or that people are being kind of lobbied to distort the data to say that they're atheists when they, in fact, maybe occasional church goes and still have a, a personal faith? These figures are very robust, John, and I would, I would say that based on other research we've run, looking at um, national studies of Australians that are representative in nature, it's about the same in terms of about 9%, 8% of the population adhere to a religion other than Christianity. Now, when we asked people, what religion do you currently identify with, not the census question of what is that person's religion, we find about 45% still identify currently with Christianity. Now, when you take the 9% who adhere to other religions, um, you do get that breakdown where Islam's growing, um, as we can see now, over overstepping Buddhism as, as the top religion. Um, and yet, th those, those figures are representative of what's happening in our communities. Now, they reflect the migration patterns, they reflect the changing of the guard in terms of Australia in the Asian century, uh, but they certainly are not to be questioned in many ways. They've been proven again and again by different Stephen, data. Stephen, on, on that question of, because uh, the, the data here shows that there's been well over a million new arrivals in Australia since the yeah. last census, that's yeah. in just five years. Yeah. And as a result, when we've got the majority of our, our migrants are not European, they're Asian for the mm. first time, China and India, but also the Philippines and others. When we're seeing a change in the demographic mix of a country, when we're seeing a change in the religious affiliation or, or lack of religion, does that change a country significantly? Or do we have a kind of this ingrained set of, she'll be right, mate, you know, egalitarian values, we are Australians, we know what we are, and, and the melting pot kind of turns everybody into that, that existing Australian gumbo? The Australia that I'm living in now, that my kids are growing up in, is different from the Australia that I grew up in. So, yes, Australia is undeniably changed <clears throat> by the waves of migration that happen. And that's a wonderful thing. We live in a very open society. We're more multicultural now than the UK, almost like two to one, apparently. Mm. Um, we're much more multicultural than the US. And we're yet... Despite all of that, we're much safer and happier and uh, we get on better. So you could say that the Australian, you know, fair go attitude, if you like, has actually imprinted over the generations despite the waves of, uh, waves of migration or even perhaps because of the waves of migration. We're a much more accepting country and I love that. Yeah. By the way, it's 10 years since Elle came to Australia today. Did you Congratulations. Know? Oh, thank you. Congratulations. Yes. Now, Amal, the, when we see Australia having 26% of, of Australians born overseas, 49% with at least one parent born overseas, and, and as Stephen says, that, that's twice the UK and the US. Mm -hmm. so, so we feel good about that. But, of course, we've had 25 years of uninterrupted economic growth. These are the good times. Do you worry what happens in the bad times, that we could actually see the kind of strife that we see elsewhere in multicultural countries where that glue starts to, to drop away and, and the divisions emerge? Oh, well, I, I think we're already seeing a lot of problems in terms of Australia's multiculturalism. I don't think it's as robust as 
you, you think it is. I, I would love to think it is, but I feel that the rise of identity politics, for example, is a, a good, good, you know, example of how people are genuinely questioning their place in society, whether or not they're accepted by other people. Um, and I think this is a very different. I'm, I'm in my late 30s, so my generation, we probably didn't grow up feeling that way. We are the result of th that first wave of migration. Mm -hmm. So we are questioning a lot more now because I feel like when we first came to Australia, migrants were shopkeepers and they were taking menial jobs. Their kids are lawyers and engineers now and journalists and, and all of these things. And it's a lot more threatening to people. So ask any migrant kid, have you ever hmm. experienced racism? And they probably have in the workforce, so institutionalised racism. So, so, so you're yeah. suggesting that, that we, were, we were happy with the kind of con the fruiter stereotype, yeah. the, the, the cheerful migrant who sells us things, but if, if we're you know, going for a job in middle management up against somebody whose parents were migrants, we suddenly become racist. Well, it's, it's not a, I don't like to just say, oh, someone's racist. It's, it's actually deeper than that. There's, there's a psychological element here. I'm not an academic, but I would say that there is absolutely a sense of threat when um, you feel... And why else do we use... We hear politicians saying they're taking your jobs or they're... It's this sense of ownership that is eroded when you start to see someone uh, who doesn't look like you and then you mm. say to them, you need to act like us, and the minute you do, you're still attacked. So I, I guess my point was I don't think we have this post-racial nirvana happening mm. right now. <laughs> I, I think it's a fascinating point, Jeff. Uh, when we're talking about a million new arrivals since 2011, and the data shows that, as Amal suggests, they do not look like us, mm. uh, more from India, more from China rather than from England and Scotland and Ireland and, and so on. Little wonder, therefore, that there are older white Australians who look around them and say, I'm not racist, but my country is changing. These people don't look like me. I mean, it almost seems like there, there, there's an almost logical tension there that emerges. Well, I think we should remind ourselves that the great migration from Southern Europe after the war didn't come without tensions, mm. uh, and that's mm. uh, an important point to make. I think multiculturalism is not a finished story. I mean, multiculturalism is a way of looking at the world, of learning how to live with difference, in ensuring that people's rights are protected, ensuring that, you know, in, in our community that hateful and, and vicious attempts to uh, exploit people of a different race or, or attempts to denigrate them or whatever, it, it can't be part of the story. So you've always got to be working on multiculturalism. I mean, living with difference is one of the great themes, of course, of human society. Mm -hmm. How do we live with all of the differences that are there? And, uh, you know, as, as one of the stories from the Bible pointed out, you know, on the road from Jericho to Jerusalem, there was that wounded man. And uh, what's your attitude towards that wounded man? If you go in with prejudice and uh, think that they're not someone you can help out because they're different, I think we failed as a community. So I think uh, it's very important that we preserve our multicultural aspirations. Hell. I think certainly to your point, Jeff and John, older Australians struggle more than younger Australians with these topics. Yep. And what we find in research when we speak to young Australians, they're much more open and broad and, and receptive to speaking about different types of religions in their workplace communities. Whereas when we speak to older Australians who are perhaps thinking about their retirement living arrangements, as we'll uh, allude to later on, they're concerned about their own ethnic um, belonging and their identity. And many ind individuals who've come years ago from southern Europe, they actually want to return to their roots and be surrounded by individuals that they identify with. And so there's this move again towards what's familiar and what's comfortable as you get older. And I think that will be a challenge for us in the coming years. Stephen, I'm interested as a, as a Christian, do you feel as though Christian values have made Australia's multiculturalism the success that it has been? And that possibly, we, we take for granted that, you know, yeah. Christian churches are involved heavily in charities, uh, working with refugees and new arrivals and so on. Yeah. The less Christian we become, the less open to other religions we become in a kind of funny way. Um, gosh, what a question. I, I think uh, Christians are very welcoming to the outsider. That's the point that Jeff was making. Mm. Last Sunday on my program, I was speaking with the minister of a church, an Anglican church in Bankstown. Very, very multicultural. And they've got the Syrian and Iraqi refugees. And suddenly, within the last few months, they've all been coming to the church asking for blankets, asking for olive oil, asking for heaters, and coming to church and sitting there to listen to what's being said because they want a sense of the spiritual. They want a sense of you know, 
know, that community. And so now the church is bringing in interpreters to sit with them so they can be part of the... Well, it's a fantastic story. And that's exactly what it's been like since... I'm not saying there haven't been tensions. Since the Chinese came to the gold fields, there were tensions. But you get this wave of migration, a bit of a backlash. Some politician says, you know, it's not my Australia anymore. Thankfully, that politician doesn't have a lot of sway in this country. And if I had my way, she'd have even less sway. But then you get this the actual community reaching out in love, in particular in the case of Christians, that's what we're called to do. And if you don't do that, then you're actually not living by the Jesus mandate. I'm interested in the, the, uh, the figure that shows the, the number of people who identify as being Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander has doubled in mm. just a little over two decades. Mm. Uh, is there an explanation for that, uh, whether it's, it's uh, in the gathering of that data or, uh, or is it, I mean, some will suggest, oh, there are more people that are trying to, you know, get some free handout from the government. So they're putting their hand up saying, yeah, I'm, I'm Indigenous. I mean, is there any way to know why that number has, has increased so dramatically? I think this comes back to identity, isn't it? It's about what you as an individual belong to and what you identify with. And certainly for this increase in numbers, currently there's 650,000 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders individuals that were recorded in the census. These individuals, they find a heightened sense of, of identity with their background and where they've come from. And I think we've seen that across the board as uncertainty is rife and as we're trying to hold on to a, a number of safety and work out who are we in this world of chaos and pace of life where things just seem to be accelerating and out of control. It is that move towards where have we come from, who do we belong to? And, and certainly that shows in, in that 2.8%. Now, interestingly, in looking at the data, 60% of those individuals live in New South Wales and Queensland. And so the demographic graphics of, of the cohort of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander individuals is really striking and very different to the population demographic of Australians generally. It's a much younger population. You've got huge communities of, of young Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people throughout New South Wales and Queensland um, that are very, very different to, to the overall population generally. I think it's important to note that belief in God isn't necessarily going to lead to uh, actions that might be consistent with what uh, Stephen's called the Jesus mandate. I mean, there are a lot of, a lot of uh, religions, of course, that restrict the truth to their own tribe and uh, others are not given the same status. And I think, you know, that's the double barrel side of Christianity, for example. On the one hand, it's got some good things in there. On the mm. other hand, it has a, you know, a tribalistic attitude towards the world. Uh, <laughs> God and, left mm. uh, religion in the hands of people. There was your problem. Yeah. Well, now, you let's, know. Let, let's, <laughs> let's leave religion there for the moment. because I want to talk a little bit about some of the reasons why we have so many migrants coming to Australia, more than a million in five years. And, and part of the reason for that, of course, is demographics, because we as a nation are getting older, one in six of us now over the age of 65. So, so Jeff Gallup, this is, a, this is an economic driver as oh. well. It's not just our innate generosity, mm. come and share the, the joy and everything else. With uh, fertility rates below uh, two now, we, we're not replacing each generation. So if we don't want the economy to stagnate, we need young people coming out mm. here and working. Look, there's no question about the fact that the migrant experience in Australia, whether you're talking, you know, in, the, in that immediate post-war period with Southern Europe coming very strongly, or you're talking more recently with India and China, you add value to your community. I mean, how do you create jobs? I mean, one way you create jobs, I think, is having more links around the world, having more uh, energetic people within your community, opening it up to uh, uh, differences. And, and that, that creates a dynamic which is good for everyone. It has its tensions, which mm. have to be managed and dealt with. But the notion that Australia can put a big border around itself and create jobs without being part of the global economy is a very foolish and, I think, retrograde uh, step. Now, on that note, I want to leave the census there for the time being because we're going to read a lot more about it and probably talk a lot more about it in coming days on the drum but before we run out of time tonight there are calls today for an inquiry into tougher regulation of the retirement industry after that joint ABC Fairfax investigation revealed exploitation of elderly residents by nursing home and retirement village operators. Four Corners last night heard from a number of older people who'd signed pretty complicated contracts that saw them pay massive fees when they sold their properties in these retirement villages. Take a look. I think it's extortionate, uh, I think it's exploitative. The process of getting out means that uh, for two years I paid $78,000 for the, for the privilege. You basically got no comeback, as in when mum, when I, mum got dementia and I had to get her out of the place, I said, OK, we'll sell the unit, and then I found out that they've got the right to hold the unit, not They've got the right not to sell the unit for 12 months. I was charged 2,000 a month as a maintenance fee on the unit. 
There's been pretty bipartisan reaction to that. The Minister for Aged Care, Ken White, today saying he's disappointed by what he saw. He wants to go back and look at previous investigations into that before announcing a new investigation. Bill Shorten says he's prepared to work with the government to try and find a solution to all of this. And this has come up a number of times federally and at a state level before. But Amal, I guess one of the questions that is being asked now is, is the fundamental problem here, even if you want to regulate it or reduce the exit fees and everything else, we've got people running retirement villages who are in it for the money and these are old vulnerable people who probably don't have much money and are you know, dwindling in their powers and they're terribly vulnerable and they always will be. Absolutely. Uh, what's happened is that Australia is you know, critically unprepared for the fact that we have an ageing population. Our family structures have changed. We don't have the traditional nuclear, nuclear family anymore where you know, parents can rely on their children to look after them. And also there is a big difference between retirement village and aged care facility. Mm. And it sounds like uh, there's a bit of an unholy communion happening there <laughs> with, with that. So I, I think what's happened is the government hasn't really come to sort of has, hasn't really like monitored this situation enough, so it's created a vacuum, and that's when uh, dodgy operators can come in and take advantage of these people. Mm. And so that's why more robust regulation is necessary. But of course, the downside to that is um, too much regulation will stifle investment. And, and I think the solution is the government needs to figure out how, how to pay for, uh, I guess, not only just addressing existing structures, because people want to age in place. They actually don't want to leave their home, mm. but their homes are not built for them. In their, yeah. in their old age. Now, Elle, that, that's one of the things that people do suggest is, you know, do we even need retirement villages these days? Why not stay in the village that you're living in as a, an adult or a mm. child? Why not stay in community and get, you know, help into your own home? Should we be focusing more on that, do you think? I think one of the things with this story to remember is that this is just one part of the, the picture of aged care. Of course, mm. uh, independent living makes up about, about 6% of Australians over the age of 65 end up in independent living. And most Australians, when they end up in independent living, they realise that's not a commercial financial choice that they're making. They're not making an investment. They're not buying an investment property. There's, there's other categories for investments outside of the independent living sector for that. And so they make that decision because they want to be in an environment that's safe, that's secure. And the other part of the picture that's missing is that there's, there's over 1,200 providers of aged care services in Australia, and only 30% of those are private providers. So the history mm. of aged care provision is in the not-for-profit sector, where the values that we've been discussing in form this, mm. the service provision, just like they inform education or a service delivery to other sectors of the vulnerable and needy in our communities. Do you think, Stephen, that, that there is a place for the corporate sector because they'll offer more choices, higher end accommodation, you know, resort living, etc., rather than kind of, you know, dreary old nursing homes and so on that the <laughs> church might offer? Oh dear, I think that some <laughs> of those church-run places offer really exciting uh, options as well. Look, uh, we all, I hope we don't get to the stage where in Australia we think that all profit is a bad thing. Um, but nevertheless, the, the vast bulk have been um, charitable organisations that are not for profit. But the, one of the answers is in research done recently by the University of Technology, Sydney. They've talked about new models for community housing. I really like what you were saying earlier, Amal, about uh, the option to, to, to age in place. And imagine you sort of set up a, a group house or even three or four smaller units within a suburban block where you actually spent most of your life. So you were mm. still down the road from your own church or mosque or you still you know, in the shops or your kids were nearby and you aged with four or five of your close friends. Um, we've got people mm. we've been tracking with since our wedding, you know, we would love mm. to grow old with them and just share that time with our friends rather than having to find something that's way out of our orbit and suddenly we're lonely. No mm. one wants that. Jeff, do you think that, that, that governments do need to step up here and if people are facing things like, you know, 30, 40% mm. exit fees when they're selling yeah. their property, that, if, you know, that, that that is excessive or at least they need to know, as was suggested Look, by Elle, that, that, you know, that, that this is not like a normal investment. If you're paying $200,000 for a retirement mm. village apartment, don't think you're going to make money on it. You will lose money on it because that's the way the system is structured. Well, I, I, I watched the, the Four Corners and my, my thoughts were that the nature of those contracts were quite exploitative. Mm. Uh, 180 and, and, pages in some uh, cases. And really, that matter needed to be addressed. I mean, mm. uh, contractual relationships, you know, are always a bit more complicated than we'd like them to be. Mm. But in that case, it looked as though all of the, all of the power was on one side of the table. And for people uh, to have to sell something to one potential buyer, th there's something deeply wrong with those okay. contracts. And I think government should really uh, pass a law to make it uh, impossible to do such all a right. thing. That is all the time for the decision of the, the drum. Thank you though to our panellists, Jeff Gallup, Amal Awad, Eliane Miles and Stephen O'Doherty. Julia Baird will be here with you tomorrow night. I'll see you Friday night for our edition of Planet America, but I uh, hope you can join us then. Good night.
On ABC News tonight, where are we now? The census reveals an older, more diverse and less religious Australia. Incomes suggest many in New South Wales are missing out. Revealed the plan for a rail tunnel to slash commuting times between Sydney and Wollongong. So why has it already been shelved? And don't try this at home as Sydney man implants an opal card chip into his hand. Details at 7 o'clock. In a world gone mad. Pauline Hanson has an aeroplane. Bill Shorten has a bus. And Jackie Lambie has a spare tyre. There's only one man who can make sense of it all. The Islamic Council of Victoria asked for safe spaces where young Muslims can express themselves openly. Absolutely pointless. We already have Q&A. Sean McAuliffe's Mad as Hell, tomorrow 8.30. Tonight on ABC and iView, Ask the Doctor has everything you need to know about exercise. Then through American Eyes, a foreign correspondent special.